My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. Hello and welcome to Diplomatic Immunity. I'm Alastair Somerville, ISD's editor and producer of this podcast. Before we begin, I just wanted to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in over the course of our first season. We really appreciate you listening as we attempt to break down some of the diplomatic challenges facing the United States and the world today. Please remember to share the podcast with your friends and family to help us reach new listeners who may be interested in diving into the world of diplomacy and international affairs. You're about to hear our last interview of season one with our friend and colleague, Andrew Imbri. Andrew is a senior fellow at Georgetown's Center for Security and Emerging Technology, and he's just published a book about the future of US strategy and foreign policy, Power on the Precipice, the six choices America faces in a turbulent world. Previously, he served as a member of the policy planning staff at the State Department, where he was a speechwriter to Secretary of State John Kerry. Before moving to the department, he served as a professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he now also teaches foreign policy speechwriting and rhetoric to students at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. He is also an alum of Georgetown. I'm here with Kelly McFarland, ISD's Director of Programs of Research, who interviewed Andrew for this episode. Kelly, what have been some of your highlights from the first season of Diplomatic Immunity and some of your main reflections on what we've learned and discussed so far? Thanks, Alistair. I'd also like to thank our listeners, and we look forward to continuing our frank and candid conversations in the new year. I think for me, uh, there were two things that really stood out this season, both of which correlate with two of our main goals for this podcast. The first is bridging the gap between academics and policy practitioners and between these groups and the public. Each of our episodes did this in at least some way. Both former Deputy Secretary of State Bob Zellick and Andrew Embry used their roles as practitioners to try and reach a broader audience as they wrote about the way forward in US foreign policy. At the same time, their books are both historical and or break down issues of international relations theory in a way that will be useful for academics to copy to make their work usable for policymakers in the public. Second, I think our slate of interviews demonstrates in stark terms the importance of history. Uh, I know that's shocking coming from the in-house US diplomatic historian, but history as we have seen it throughout the season can help us make sense of current events, offer up some potential ways forward with caveats of course, and allow citizens to better confront problems like misinformation and disinformation. Our final discussion of the season highlights these two main themes perfectly. Andrew bridges the gap between policymaker and academic as he tries to distill key international relations ideas to a broader public, as he pinpoints what he sees as the six main choices America will have to make, and as he uses history to help make his arguments. This mix has created an important and accessible book. Thanks, Kelly. And you can check out all of our episodes Uh, on the ISD website, isd.georgetown.edu. But for now, let's listen to the conversation with Andrew Embry. Today on Diplomatic Community, we have Andrew Embry, a colleague of ours at CSET at Georgetown, and someone that I also uh, overlapped with at the State Department back in our time when he was working for Secretary of State John Kerry, and I was uh, briefing him on a daily basis. And uh, Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Uh, It's absolutely a delight to be here. So uh, Andrew, as we hop into the first question here, um, I think it would be good if you could just sort of provide our listeners a little bit of your background, um, kind of talk about, you know, how you grew up, because that's an interesting part of you know, where you are now and why you wrote this book, and give a little bit of context on, on working for uh, Secretary Kerry and and sort of what you learned in that experience. We can start there. Well, that's that's a terrific set of questions, and I'm grateful you you pointed out that I'm wearing the same outfit uh, that I'm wearing in the book jacket cover. I realized I got to update my wardrobe. Uh, no, you're so, just you're just staying on point. You know, you're just <laughs> so uh, 
Well, so I grew up the son of a foreign service officer. Uh, and so a lot of my life was spent uh, early in my life bouncing around from country to country, mostly between Europe and the United States. Uh, and I think, you know, I look back on that fondly because I think it, it really gives you a sense of what your own country stands for, its, its, its values and its aspirations, but also how uh, to see your country through the eyes of other people. I think it gives you a good sense of the fact that other countries aren't monoliths either. They're made up of a whole plurality of, of actors and interests. And I think that that kind of carries with you uh, as you get older. Um, but I, you know, I, I spent some time in, in England and when I got there, this was a time when uh, the IRA bombing campaigns were still happening in the early 90s. And there were, there were multiple bombing threats uh, in London. Uh, there, were, there were bombs in our neighborhood. So it was a scary time. And it was also a reminder that you know, sectarian conflict can really intrude on your day-to-day -day life as well. Uh, and then I remember still being in the UK when we uh, intervened in the Balkans. Uh, and this was sort of a, the, the height of American uh, power and purpose. And then I, I was later in Brussels uh, when, you know, we were seeing sort of the beginnings of the global financial crisis just a couple of years after when we went into Iraq. So I also, so I sort of went from seeing the application of American power to the sort of tensions and contradictions uh, in American power. But it was really a, a formative experience for me growing up the son of a foreign service officer, appreciating what our, our diplomats and development experts do. Uh, so I, I still carry that with me. And then I uh, ended up taking a sort of, um, you know, I initially thought that I, I was really interested in comparative literature and history. And I eventually ended up taking on a, a foreign policy job in the US Senate. And for a couple of years, I was, a, I was a policy staffer. And then toward the tail end of my time in the Senate, I picked up speech writing. And that's really what, what brought me to the State Department. Uh, and what's really interesting, just as a, by way of background, is that you know, I think when you're in the Senate, uh, you're, you're thinking about how to tell the story uh, that your member cares about and what kind of interest he or she wants to speak to. And you're you're speaking ultimately for a constituency, you know, one of your your home your state senator, your your house member, your senate senator's home district. And when you move from there to the state department, you know, your constituency expands to the country, and you start to think about how to tell your country's story to the world. And in speech writing, one of the one of the key uh, dimensions is this this concept of ethos, sort of characterization. And you're often thinking about how do we characterize our country to the world, but also how do we tell the stories of the world back to Americans and build that connection? So it was a really important uh, experience for me to sort of shape my outlook on things. Following on to that, sort of what made you want to write this book um, and why now? And then also, uh, you know, something that I think is good for folks that haven't necessarily read the book as we start getting into some more specifics later is sort of what is your, what, what's your elevator pitch, so to speak? And for, for folks that you know, aren't familiar with elevator pitch. Um, that's something I learned when I first went to the State Department and they always said, if you found yourself in the elevator with the Secretary of State, what is your, how would you pitch them on your pet project in the time it took to get from the main level of the State Department to the seventh floor? You know, in a way this, the germ of this started uh, in grad school at Georgetown when I was thinking historically about how do countries respond to a relative cut in their power? What are the kinds of strategies they use to bounce back? And can we learn anything from history? And I, at the time, did not look uh, at the United States. I focused on other countries. I was, I was particularly focused on uh, British naval strategy in the late 19th and early 20th century and on, on French defense strategy in the interwar years. And after I had finished my dissertation work, you know, I, I was working full time as a speechwriter, a member of the policy planning staff at the State Department. And I remember a sort of crystallizing event that happened, uh, which was that, you know, sort of in the intervening years, obviously a lot had changed. You know, we had seen, uh, you know, the global financial crisis. We had seen the weaponization of networks of interdependence. We'd seen a whole host of new technologies come into play. Uh, China was becoming much more assertive. Uh, Russia was posing a real challenge. Uh, but, but there was an experience on the road traveling with Secretary Kerry that sort of added another question uh, to the mix. And this was, we were, uh, it was in the fall of 2013, and we were, as speechwriters, helping the secretary prepare for a trip to the Asia Pacific. And so we were working on speeches. 
and trying to think about how to convey the importance and the stakes of President Obama's rebalance to the Asia Pacific. And when Secretary Kerry was on this trip, uh, he was there with President Obama and right in the middle of the trip, a crisis hit. And it wasn't a crisis emanating uh, from abroad. It was a crisis on the home front. Our government shut down because the Congress couldn't pass a budget. President Obama had to leave Asia and uh, Secretary Kerry had to, um, you know, sort of uh, convey the message of America at a time where we were clearly very polarized. And, you know, what this event drove home for me is that our uh, credibility in the world is inextricably linked to our uh, our democracy at home, the state of our democratic institutions, our ability to get things done for ordinary people, uh, and to to get beyond sort of the just the, the raw partisan polarization uh, that's afflicted our our country for a long time. And the polarization, I think, has become uh, a deepening crisis in the country. And what I noticed at the time was that it really prevents us from coming up with bipartisan agreement on foreign policy, which ends up resulting in wild swings on policy from one administration to the next, makes it harder to draw lessons learned about our foreign policy successes and failures, makes it difficult to come up with a sensible approach to negotiations that isn't an all or nothing approach. And I think above all, it makes it difficult to have a serious public debate about the major foreign policy questions on the table. And I do think the last couple of years have really forced us all to return to basic principles in foreign policy. And that's really what I try to do in this book is to sort of wrestle with some of these fundamental questions and trade-offs uh, that are at stake in American foreign policy. And in terms of my elevator pitch, sort of to sum it up, I think there are, you know, there's sort of a stylized debate where which says, you know, America is destined for continued dominance or doomed to irreversible decline. And as a student of, of, of history, you know, I think there are a whole host of structural pressures that are bearing down on us. Those pressures shape and condition and constrain our choices, but they don't determine our choices. And so I think we really do have fateful choices to make and how leaders navigate those trade-offs is really gonna matter. And so my, my sort of argument in the book is that we are in a post-dominant world, a sort of transitional era where power is gonna be more contest contested, our influence is harder to wield, rules of the road are less fixed. This doesn't mean that we were always dominant once before and now we're not. It's just that our margin of preeminence is not quite what it once was. Our margin of error is shrinking, our resource constraints are tightening. So we have to think about how to reimagine our role in a post-primacy world. We have to move in what, what I argue in the book from a strategy of dominance to a strategy of leadership that harnesses our broad network of allies and partners, reinvigorates our diplomacy and development, and also shores up our state capacity and our ability to invest broadly and wisely in things like science, basic science, research and development, infrastructure and education. Yeah, and, and and that definitely comes through in the in reading the book. And I really enjoyed the book and, and we'll get into some more of the historical aspects in a bit here. We do find ourselves in, in you know right now in a moment of decision. Um and it's you know it's it's been coming for some time. Um we've been talking about it for some time, but it really is sort of the time where the rubber meets the road here. And and we do need to make a decision, but you know. As a historian, I also realized too that throughout American history, Americans have a really hard time of making these trade-offs and these difficult trade-offs in foreign policy when they are not faced with a, um, a, a, a catastrophe or a huge dilemma that makes them, that forces them to make these decisions a la you know, World War I, World War II, things like this. So I think you know, how we get to what brings us to make those decisions now. I, I think that's going to be telling and is going to take some very forceful leadership from the top um, in, in the coming years. So, um, but, you know, moving on and, and getting more into the book, you, you uh, sort of uh, structure the book around these six choices that you talk about that America currently faces. And could you go into a little bit more detail on what those six choices are and, and how you came up with those six. Why these six? So the, the first is the choice of core or periphery. 
And it's really a question of where, when, and how we employ military force and whether we should be intervening in faraway lands. And in this chapter, as in the others, I try to tell the story of a leader who's wrestled with this choice firsthand. And I tell the story of a, of a young lieutenant who was deployed to Kandahar in Afghanistan. And then I look back into history and ask, well, you know, are there any lessons that we can learn from, from the past, from other countries that have wrestled with this challenge? And I look at the British and Soviet interventions uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and I try to draw some lessons from that. The next choice is on butter or guns. And this is really a question of how we channel our resources. How do we rebalance our national toolkit? And how do we shape a global economy in a way that supports a strong and growing middle class? And in this, in this choice, like in others, it's really about calibration. It's about how to balance between competing ends. In this case, it's the question of, do you invest more in infrastructure, education, basic science, and R&D, or more in building up modern uh, military hardware and software uh, platforms and personnel? And in this case, it's not an either or proposition. You've always got to set the right balance between them. And the question in the chapter is, you know, are we setting that balance correctly today? And I think we need to do a lot more to rebuild and reinvigorate our diplomacy and development tools. And for this chapter, I tell the story of an innovator on AI and other emerging technologies who led uh, DARPA. And she has an incredible story to tell. And I think also important insights to share about how the global s and picture and innovation is changing over the last couple of years and how we can harness that to our advantage in this country. And so I tell her story. And then I also look back uh, into history uh, at the uh, case of Imperial Spain in the 17th century to understand how other countries have balanced this choice between butter and guns. Uh, the next one is allies or autonomy. And this really gets at the question of, you know, which allies are worth dying for? And how do we adapt our broad network of allies and partners to meet new challenges? And for this chapter, I tell the story of one of our great diplomats uh, right after 9-11 and the diplomacy that took place at NATO when the North Atlantic Treaty Organization invoked its mutual defense clause, Article 5, for the first time, which was uh, meaningful because I think in historical terms, the assumption was always that America would be coming back uh, to aid the Europeans. And in this case, NATO uh, countries invoked Article 5 to show solidarity with us uh, and came to our aid. And many allies and partners uh, fought side by side with us uh, in in the fights to come. So it's uh, it was an important moment. I tell his story and then I tell the interesting case of the Austrian Habsburg Empire and their alliance strategies, because I just think while, you know, we can talk a little bit about how to draw these analogies carefully and, you know, what the limits are, but I think it's really interesting to look at how other countries used alliances to their advantage and also shape the time horizons of competitors in ways uh, that were ultimately beneficial to their long-term interest and values. And so that's the, that's the case that I tell in this book, uh, this uh, chapter. And then the next choice is about persuasion or coercion. And this is really a choice about how to manage the rise of peer competitors. How do we do it in a way that safeguards our interests and values, uh, but also doesn't court disaster or foreclose the opportunity to cooperate on fundamental transnational challenges? Uh, and in this case, uh, obviously China looms large uh, as a comparison in this chapter. For the, for the story, I tell the, 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 about the efforts of one of Georgetown's own, uh, Nick Gallucci, who was an ambassador uh, and a negotiator on North Korea and how the United States tried to manage that very tough challenge. And then I, I look to history at one of the sort of seminal power transitions that occurred between the United States and Great Britain. And I look at some of the lessons there about how that was managed and whether or not you can really apply that fully to some of the power, the questions that we face today. Then the, the next choice is, I thought something different for these kinds of topics, but I think it was really important, which is people power pinstripe rule. It's really a question about trust in institutions, use of strategic networks of corruption and how they can corrode the foundations of democratic institutions. And I look at, I tell the story of a, of a woman who is a scholar and uh, anti-corruption activist. 
and what she's learned from, from her life traveling around the world, trying to deal with this challenge and how she interprets what's really interesting sort of ancient myths for modern times and how she understands this problem and what are some concrete policy solutions that we can use to deal with it. And then I look uh, to history to the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century and as I think a warning from history uh, about the sort of dangers of, of patrimony and the dangers of, of institutional decay uh, and, and corruption. And I think it's, it's a really important uh, message for shoring up a country's power. And the final choice is open or closed. And this one deals with what, sh you know, what is the, the fate and future of what we call the, the sort of rules-based international order, this system of rules and norms and agreements uh, that helps structure relations among countries, that mobilize cooperation, that provide predictability and transparency on fundamentally uh, global issues. One thing I'd say about just why I chose these six, uh, I would say three reasons. One is that I think all of them involve difficult trade-offs. And for each one, it's not an easy black or white answer. And there are often uh, complicated decisions that have to be made for each. So take core and periphery. I take a skeptical look at large scale military interventions uh, in the periphery. At the same time, what happens if you leave some of these challenges unattended? And so we have to think really carefully about what preventative diplomacy and development looks like, how to evolve divisions of labor with allies and partners. Uh, and that involves just a whole tangle of difficult topics. And one of the interesting dilemmas uh, and one scholar at the, at the Carnegie Endowment, Ashley Tellis, calls it the hegemon's dilemma, is that what do you do when you have created uh, a rules-based system that helps conserve your interests and values, but may also create the environment for the rise of other peer competitors? And how do you negotiate those kinds of tensions? The second reason I picked the choices I did is because I think they bridge the domestic and the international. Uh, and I think we're at a moment right now where we're trying to figure out how to make foreign policy work better for the middle class. And we're also trying to look for all the connections that bind the two together, whether that's on trade or on climate or on inequality. There's a whole host of questions about how to make our engagement in the world uh, support our growth at home and to support what the American people care about. And I do think one of the lessons I've learned certainly from the last couple of years is that for foreign policy to be successful it has to enjoy a broad basis of public support. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. And the last thing I'd say is just that I do think that applied history uh, has is so important for understanding the stakes of the moment we're in. And I do think history is a storehouse of wisdom, carefully done. And I, I think all of these choices lend themselves to historical analysis and to understanding how other countries have wrestled with them. I do think that uh, we can learn from from other countries around the world today, but also looking in the past. And I, again, I think that has to be carefully done and analogies can always be misapplied. Uh, but I do think it's it's illuminating in terms of the choices that we face. And as an applied historian, and you know, we do case studies in history here at ISD and and uh, use them as a teaching tool. I was very glad to see that, you know, you're also using, you know, history wasn't didn't start in 1991 or 1945. You know, there are things that we can learn from uh, beyond those dates. So that was good to see. So moving towards the towards the end of the book, I've I've always been fascinated by Eisenhower's Project Solarium uh, and the idea of having this sort of intense, high level strategic review early in your presidency to really map out where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. Um, can you give us a little bit of background on why you talk about this in the book and why you're calling for Project Solarium 2.0? So I think we're at a moment, uh, there's an interesting debate about the role uh, of strategy uh, in our foreign policy. And at, in one, at one level, I think there's a question of, you know, when, when the balance of power is shifting, uh, when we're moving into sort of a more competitive multipolar landscape, when we're polarized at home, and we're instant and there are institutions are fragmented is there a place for strategy or or not and my sense is that it, strategy is more important than ever when you're facing uh difficult challenges abroad and a deepening polarization at home it's really important to cultivate uh, a sort of strategic habit of mind 
and to be able to understand how to think about these important problems. And I do think really good strategy integrates a whole range of policies and principles uh, and ties them to our highest interest, our broadest objectives over the long term, and figures out how to link ends, ways, and means. And that is a really important task, I think, for the next years. Uh, and one of the, the sort of models of strategic planning was this exercise that President Eisenhower uh, convened uh, in the solarium room of the White House in the early 1950s. And it's often regarded as a model of strategic planning. And in some respects, I think that's because he had a clear sense of where he wanted to go. He had a sense of priorities, but he also knew and understood the political dimensions. He, he had to deal with a cabinet and a party that wasn't necessarily on the same page. And so this exercise allowed for a clear prioritization, but it also allowed for a sort of organizational adoption of these priorities. And it figured out how to connect these priorities to means, to resources and to the budget. And so I think that's a really uh, vital exercise to go through. And my, my attempt at sort of thinking about how this could apply to present times, I tried to situate some of the main uh, strategic patterns of thought into what Eisenhower ha organized, which were sort of three teams. So he, he organized a team A, a team B, and a team C. And team A was sort of thinking through applications of George Kennan's strategy, you know, the importance of sort of the political and economic dimensions of containment, the importance of our allies, uh, and thinking about, you know, our trust and credibility in the world and competing for the long term. And his team B was focused uh, more on questions of you know, nuclear deterrence and how we should structure that. And Team C took a sort of a more, uh, a more forthright, assertive approach, uh, covert action and a whole host of other strategies that could be summed up under sort of a rollback approach. And he managed to, I think he combined elements of all three, but he managed to sort of drive home his fundamental priorities through this exercise and build a political foundation for it, and then build a consensus in the bureaucracy and through the budgeting process. And I think we'd be well served by a similar strategic planning exercise today. And if you look at sort of some of the main schools of thought, whether that's restraint or a liberal internationalism or primacy, or even a much more, you know, even if it's isolationism, there are, I think this is an exercise that helps tease out fundamental assumptions and can help uh, produce, I think, a set of priorities that approximate, you know, the interests and values of the American people. And so I do think at a time of, of change, in a transitional era, as I write about in the book, it's really useful to sort of have a very clear sense of our priorities and then how to match resources and commitment. I, I sort of do this over the course of the chapter and then conclude with a set of proximate solutions uh, to some of the problems. So I, I advocate for an approach of consolidate, adapt, and compete. And I try to tease out what I mean by each of these, drawing on some of the insights of the different schools and what they have to say. And I, I do think it's, it's a helpful exercise, uh, particularly at a time when, as I said earlier, our margin for error is shrinking and our resource constraints are, are getting tighter. And so I think we have to be mindful about both the highest priorities, the biggest challenges to those priorities, and then the tools we have available. And I do think exercises like this are, are a useful way to, to sort of build a conceptual map for a fast changing world. You know, I've seen a lot of things over the last couple of years mentioning Project Solarium and, and calling for a, a present day Project Solarium but that's about all they do. Um, and they don't really kind of go into details on, on like, what would you be, you know, what would team A, team B and team C be arguing for and why and all that kind of stuff. And you actually walk through the different schools of thought right now, the sort of that you mentioned there, um, liberal international and restrained isolationism, but we'll get you out of here on one last question. Um, and, you know, you wrote this book during the uh, current administration, um, and now we're going to have a new administration coming in in you know a few weeks. Um, what is your outlook uh, on on sort of 
the election of Joe Biden and, and the bringing in of his his staff, uh, many many of the folks that will be doing this stuff, you and I know, um, on the way you see America's efforts to tackle the problems you talk about in the book. No, I do. I mean, what I see from uh, from the president elect and the vice president elect and their team is a fundamental understanding of the stakes and the critical choices that we have to face as a country. So I think it's it's very encouraging. The I think the fundamental uh, priorities that I've seen uh, map on to these these choices. So we, we're, we've seen uh, an increasing focus on the need to revitalize our alliances on the need to rebalance our national security toolkit and really invest in diplomacy and development, on the need to make sure that what we're doing abroad really works for working families and the middle class at home, on the need to bolster multilateral institutions uh, because they represent uh, not only a way to mobilize cooperation on transnational challenges, but they also reflect our interests and values and help us conserve influence for the long term. And how do we make sure that our uh, our alliances are really fit for purpose, especially at a time when a lot of the challenges that we're seeing to our allies are coming below the, mil the military threshold, whether that's on economics and energy or information manipulation. And so how do we adapt a lot of these partnerships and al alliances to meet those kinds of challenges? And so I, I sort of do see that fundamental recognition. And I also, as someone who cares about history, see this as a sort of perennial debate in our national story about how do we make sure that we are sort of widening the circle of rights and enlarging the definition of we the people. And I think this has been a, uh, a story of progress and reversals in the country. Uh, and so I'm certainly hopeful that we can be moving in the right direction. The president-elect has called for a summit for democracy in the first year. Uh, and, you know, one lesson as a speechwriter that I, I sort of take uh, is both a sense of and sort of a sense of humility, but also a sense of confidence about what we can do in this country comes from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And in that very first line of the address, he calls equality a proposition. But if you go back four score and seven years ago to the Declaration of Independence, our founders called equality a self-evident truth. And it's an interesting distinction uh, between calling equality self-evident, which requires sort of no further evidence or elaboration. We're calling equality a proposition, something that has to be shown through our choices. And I do think that's a timeless lesson from Lincoln to the present day, which is that there isn't anything guaranteed and that part of the progress in democracy has to come from making these fundamental choices uh, and understanding that, you know, if we put in the hard work of citizenship, we can try to uh, shore up the country for a more promising future, but it's not guaranteed. There's nothing inevitable about it. And I, I do see that promise and that sense of understanding, uh, you know, on the horizon. All right. Some heavy words to end on today. Andrew Embry, I appreciate it. Um, the book is called Power on the Precipice, The Six Choices America Faces in a Turbulent World. Um, can't thank you enough for joining us today uh, and being our uh, final interview for our inaugural season of Diplomatic Community Podcast. Um, it'll be a great way to sort of tie up this uh, semester, this year's uh, episodes. And uh, wish you all the best and success on the book. And hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, we will be able to chat uh, about this a little bit more. I look very much forward to that. It would be, it'd be great to, to see you both again and to, to have a chance to really uh, talk about these issues in person. So thanks a lot for the conversation. It was always great to connect. Thanks, Andrew. That was Diplomatic Immunity. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever they listen. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website isd.georgetown.edu.